Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper and TireRack.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 317. It's a, a very special podcast I think we've got in store for you today. I have Brian Robinson, Greg Carlos, and Jessica Ray with me, and we're going to take a look at some of the vehicles, some of the cars, the hot cars that we just finished testing in our winter testing session down at Roebling Road Raceway outside of Savannah, Georgia. Uh, we do this every year to go down and tape road test and shows for all the winter season where it's a little bit too cold to do that up here at our home base in Maryland. So we'll run down that list in just a couple of minutes. We've also got a lightning round where we put our two cents in about what you've seen in the news about all the EVs, specifically Teslas, having a really hard time keeping a charge during this terrible cold winter weather that we've been having all across the country, but especially in the Midwest. But without further ado, Brian Robinson, Ooh, hello. Greg Carlos, <laughs> it scared me too, I know. and right. Jessica Ray. Let's get right into it. We took eight cars to Roebling Roadway that we're going to talk about uh, today. Roebling is a two-mile road course that we use every uh, January to get all of our numbers and put our shows on tape uh, so we have them for the uh, winter months to, to make sure we don't basically miss any shows. How many weeks of work do you think we do in four days? In four days, I think we do about six weeks worth of work. Yeah. Hmm. I honestly right. do. It's, Robinson it's and I were talking about very concentrated. We're all very like we become a family for a week. We live with each other and we are constantly with each other. But like we do so much. Like I feel disconnected. I had no idea what was going on in the outside world. Now I'm not like super in tune with yeah. what's going on. We're in, the in world. a bubble. Yeah, We're but like I like I get home and there's like news stories that I haven't yeah. seen and things have happened. My children have grown two feet. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, I should maybe someone else can help me here. I should describe a little bit about the, where we are. We uh, it's a racetrack outside of Savannah. Everything's cooler. cooler and cooler. Right. Pooler, yeah, Georgia. Pooler. Actually, it's Bloomingdale, right. Georgia. Uh, Roebling Road Raceway. It's a two-mile road course. I think it has nine turns. Nine turns, correct. It's got about a half a mile uh, front straight that Long is uh, straight. up, down, and uphill and downhill, and it's not f not quite flat. And we took with us uh, three camera crews, correct? And we had drones, and we had uh, GoPros, every, all of the uh, accoutrements that we normally use in a road test. Everything was there. We actually start our week at uh, a location where I do my stand-ups, uh, an old mansion outside of Savannah. Uh, that they're nice enough to let us use. And then it's on to the racetrack for three days. Literally that quickly. Like yeah, we get very there quickly. We don't stop working until we go home. So the first two cars that we are going to talk about, and I'm going to use our bell so that we don't sit here and basically ramble on forever, are actually Ken's. We had a 2024 Subaru BRZ TS, their new TS version. I'll let somebody else talk about what that means. And also the close Ken, the Toyota GR86 uh, Torino edition. I think I got that right. Trueno. 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 Trueno edition for all you of you. You say it right in the show. I say it right <laughs> in the show, but I had help. Okay. Starting now, two minutes, tell us about these two cars and maybe how they were different on the track. We're talking about the 86 and the BRZ, rear drive, front engine, sport coupe, affordable, not gobs of power, but great fun to drive. And they are cousins. They're very closely related mechanically. Yes, mechanically and even visually. Mm -hmm. So the TS package for the BRZ is basically a handling and brake upgrade, uh, new dampers, bigger brakes, manual only. And uh, the Trueno is more just like a paint uh, throwback paint scheme, but you can add a handling package uh, to that, which is essentially what we have with the TS. The TS is STI tuned, not a formal STI version, but 228 horsepower, uh, which... Compared to everything else we had down there, which was over 500, pretty much everything, mm -hmm. um, it did, they don't really feel underpowered. I mean, uh, they get around that track pretty good. Yeah, I think uh, typically those lower horsepower cars on this specific track um, struggle. 
but I didn't feel that way in these because they are uh, they're so well balanced because even though they're front engine they still have that kind of like mid engine 50-50 uh, weight balance because the engine's actually probably a little bit it's pretty far back and it's also axle. a box it's, it's a boxer engine, engine. So it's l yeah. mounted really low yeah. yeah and it's a so it's a Subaru boxer engine and um yeah, it's. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It was refreshing coming, as you alluded to, the yeah. 500 horsepower cars and 600, in some cases almost 700 horsepower cars. Getting in one of those, and then it becomes more of like the old school fun driving, where you're driving a slow car fast, and you're you're more focused on the. For me specifically, like I was more focused on my line, my downshifts, and I found that actually like you would expect with a manual low horsepower car. It was a lot of fun. And something I didn't realize is that we actually had two SUVs there and some bigger cars. And the vision that I got out of the BRZ and the GR86, I felt like I could see everything, man. Like, it was beautiful. It was depth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There weren't, like, A pillars in my way. There weren't, like, bulky B pillars. Like, I just felt like I could see the entire world in front of me. It was awesome. What about the TS treatment on the BRZ? It's weird because, yeah. like, the T. So, I mean, it's the they first go time as far as they can the without calling it an STI. Yeah. yeah. And STI is actually even in the gauges. There's an STI, right. well, digital badge yeah. in the gauges. But there's also a TS badge on the app. It's so weird, like, that they don't just go Why didn't full. Why did it has got to be something I mean, with the fact that it's also a Toyota, right? Like, yeah. they don't want to give a full STI. Maybe. But also, it's like, it doesn't have more power, right? I feel like to That's probably give it point. a true STI treatment, it you'd have to, have, to it'd have to have some sort of boost. And Quite literally boost. <laughs> yeah. It. Is it worth the money for the TS package? If, mm. Yeah, if handling is your priority and you plan on, like, uh, taking in some track days, absolutely. If uh, you have no desire to drive fast, then probably not. Okay, that's a good place to end that. You uh, Let's move on to uh, one of the SUVs there. And it Thanks wasn't for letting me finish that thought. Absolutely. <laughs> His finger was right above I, I was right. I was hovering. <laughs> I was going to draw it out and keep drawing it out see if you hit the bell or not. <laughs> okay. 2024 Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT. Who would like to start and give us a, a quick synopsis of what this really was? I feel like Greg should start because he spent a lot of time in this. A lot, man. It was to the point where, like, I told Roberts, I'm like, man, we got to get in another car because I feel like I'm in the SUVs the entire time. But it's funny because, like, those two probably surprised me the most because we've had SUVs there before. Uh, and we'll get to the next SUV, which is the Urus Performante. But the Cayenne uh, Turbo GT is surprisingly fast. Like, it is a, it is an SUV, like, of what, two and a half tons? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it also has 650 horsepower, and it was delightfully playful. Uh, I mean, it would... It was a it, true Porsche. It would step out, yeah. for sure. Yeah, like, even more so than most GT th or 911s and, and Caymans that I drive. Like, it was slippery. It does have all-wheel drive. And as we'll allude to with the other, we had the same engine in three different vehicles, which is the four liter twin turbo uh, V8. All the, each vehicle it was in, it had a different level of horsepower. It had 650 here. Uh, so th I mean, this is the, the Cayenne Turbo GT is Porsche's, you know, hot rod SUV. And uh, to me, it was like I couldn't enter corners as quickly as I could in other cars, but I would always ex if I would exit. Uh, I would probably exit faster or at least as fast as I could in anything else. Yeah, the Turbo GT is the Cayenne Coupe, uh, even though Coupe's not in the name. Uh, it's Coupe only. Uh, so it's kind of a fastback, less, yeah. not, not squarish at all. It, it takes away yeah. utility for yeah. the And it's a slight it. update over the last uh, Turbo GT. It's got wider tires on there. Uh, they upgraded the suspension to the two-chamber air suspension. Uh, there's like virtually no roll in that thing None. on the track. It did not feel like an SUV in any way, shape, or form. It didn't, it takes, look, it didn't look even it, look like yeah, an it SUV. It takes you a lap or two to wrap your head around pushing it that hard in corners. But, uh, yeah, a ton of grip and, uh, yeah, really rockets off corners, like Greg said. I was going to say, seeing it, like, coming down the street, like, especially when Greg was in it, like, hauling, I mean, it it looks like a missile just coming. It whistles, too. It does. Yeah, I was it, in the back street. Yeah. Car, car, miss, whistle. whistle missile. A whistle missile. Well, you know, getting into that front straight, getting down to the end of it, you were doing what? 160? Uh, I was approaching one. I have to go back and look, but I was approaching 160 for which sure. Is well, the the I think the the bigger thing was so we, which we'll get to the 911 GT3 Manti package. 
I was hitting the outer rumbles on turn nine at about one, between 127 and 130, which, fast. which is at, fast. The, which really is at fast. the entrance to the uh, straightaway. Correct. Yeah. And then I enter that corner at about like 102, 103. So when in the Cayenne, I probably enter at like nine, mid 90s. But by the time I'm at that outer um, rumble strip, I'm as fast as I was going in that GT3, which tells you how much power it has and, and how it, efficiently it puts it down. You probably have gathered that we take uh, high performance cars to this track. This is our once a year really high performance blowout uh, for the show. So, yeah, like it's, it's as fast as we can possibly go. Okay, and you alluded to uh, the Lamborghini Urus Performante. Let's switch gears to that. Even less looking like an SUV, especially with the uh, the trim paint that it had on it, blacking out the lower bodywork. Um, pretty amazing car. Yeah, um, Performante, vehicle, yeah, up the uh, suspension, a little more horsepower, actually 657. So a few more than the uh, Cayenne Turbo GT, uh, but man, also... It doesn't feel like an SUV at all. I would say there's a little more roll to it For than sure. the. It was, uh, it was soft is not the, the right turbo, word because yeah. it's not soft, but it was softer relative yeah. to the Cayenne. But the sound of that engine was completely different in that. Than Again, the same engine. Same four liter V8 sounded, responded totally differently. Um, I think the. Uh, I did acceleration runs in that. I went a three second uh, flat on the zero to 60. Wow. The thing so, is just. And it doesn't yeah. feel like you're and going. And this is not an EV, folks. Yeah, that thing just takes off. It sounds incredible and just hunkers down. Uh, just really more of a visceral experience, I think, than the Turbo GT. Uh, but they were both white. And they were both fast. Yeah. <laughs> both <white SUVs laughs> there, there were times where you, you were in the pits, you weren't quite sure which one was getting ready to go <laughs> by it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, everything Robinson said is true. Um, we <laughs> kind of had a team of people that came with this, this vehicle. <laughs> so they were there, uh, a couple directly from Italy. So they were very curious about what we thought. And I, like, I couldn't really come up with a ton of bad. Because, I mean, it's an SUV on a track, so I'm just happy to be able to do the things that I can do on the track. So it was exciting. Um, but it also came with, what, four sets of tires, and they were all different. And they had three, at least three sets of wheels. Yeah, different wheel sizes. So we had different well. wheels yeah. every day, and they were different sizes. We started out with the 23-inch wheels on more streetable tires. And those, uh, were, those got up to temperature quicker, and it was easier to get used to. But then, like, by about lap five or six, you notice, like, a performance drop-off. Things got a little slippery. Then day two, which ironically was the coldest day, we had the Trofeo yeah. R's on there, which are more street tires. I mean, I'm sorry, track tires. Those took, like, th two, la three laps to get warm. But then once they did, it was uh, m even more locked down than it already was. Yeah, so. We had the cold weather like everybody else. Uh, I think uh, on two mornings it was in the uh, right around freezing, if not a little bit below. Yeah, it's some of the best Lamborghini brakes I've ever driven at that track. Yeah, they were, those things were great all week long. Agreed. Sounds like a good place to stop, unless, Jessica, you didn't really well, put your two cents in. Well, I guess in. I'm, I'm curious because we had the original, the, the Urus when it debuted back in 2020. I mean, oh, what, are the, what, are the big, yeah. what are the big standouts that this Performante kind of improved on compared to that? Because, I mean, that's no slouch. I mean, yeah. it's not, this isn't a ton more horsepower I, than what you can get in a base Urus. I remember Urus. getting into the first Urus we had and thinking, like, okay, this is definitely an SUV and I need to be a little careful. And I thought that in the first two laps with the Performante, and then it was like, oh, I can just drive this thing like I've been driving all week, which was really cool. And the interior is fantastic, too. Uh, it feels like a performance car in there. Yeah. I hate to, space I hate to ask <laughs> the question, but between the, uh, the Turbo GT and the Performante, do you have a favorite? Uh, between uh, the two? As far as actually driving on track, I would go with the Turbo GT, but it's just overall package maybe the Urus I don't know That's I liked call. I liked driving the Lamborghini on the street more and I th actually I th that's a tough question yeah. <laughs> they, uh, they give me I'll, I'll go I'll go I'll be contrarian they I'll go different. Lambo the, I think they, they in the, are in the, even though suspensions are different the the Lamborghini has coils and you said that the the Cayenne has a, an air suspension right I mm -hmm. mean so that's interesting that you say, Greg, on the street that you like the Lamborghini the, a little bit the more. The target for these two vehicles is fairly similar, but I think their buyers are very different. 
I would agree. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and I think each one is tuned, I mean, for that specific, uh, specific you characteristics make more of, a of a buyer. with the Lamborghini. Oh, sure, of course, because they're rarer. Yeah. Uh, but uh, on the track, they were both pretty um, awesome to look at. Okay, now we'll do the bell. <laughs> um, you just bell yourself. <laughs> The standout when it comes to looking like uh, something more traditional that you would see on the street was the 2024 Audi RS7. What a what a terrific sedan. So this is the third vehicle we had with that 4-liter uh, twin-turbo V8. Um, did it really belong in the track? I'm not sure. Was it a heck of a lot of fun on the track? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that engine is great. Uh, it's just a, kind of a soft feel. We had the RS6, uh, which is the wagon version, over the summer. That, to me, felt you know a little more of a performance. I don't know if it was additional weight of that uh, wagon, but that felt a little more nailed down to me. This is the RS7 performance, which ups the horsepower a little bit. Um, 621, yes. as opposed to like 590. Yeah, yeah. Like so, but, uh, man, a lot of fun for a luxury car. I remember why I didn't get a chance to drive it a lot. Uh, I drove it on the street, and that's really where it shines. I think everybody had the same comment, like, not great on the track, but just supreme on oh, the street. Because it it's, it's a tour. It's a grand tour. Totally, total yeah. pleasure. And, uh, yeah, big big vehicle. Uh, it was fun watching it go around the track because of how much it leans and how much it squat. Like, zero to, zero to 60 runs, like, it would just squat. And then it almost looked yeah. like the front wheels were coming off. Yeah, the it did. Yeah. No yeah. car I've seen in a long time. And even yeah. and even draw. And it's a lot of these cars we take to Roebling now are so performance oriented that like you really don't see a lot of roll anymore. So seeing a car actually roll in corners to the point where even our drone was picking it up, it actually looks probably faster than it's going. <laughs> but it's cool. A little, and it's more, di a little more dynamic. Going and again, on. the sound coming from that, the the engine uh, and exhaust setup on that particular particular car uh is is pretty good yeah i mean that was i think it's a very attractive looking no, it's gorgeous uh, vehicle it's just in gorgeous general car. yeah i mean that that is definitely somebody who's got really good taste i think drives, and the drives wheels that. on that particular yes. color yeah. yeah there were the silver and there was no brake dust on so i don't know if it was some with the pads or they had a coating on there but it drove as many laps as our other cars and there yeah. was no brake dust i know so yeah, they look gorgeous it, all week it was shocking all right. Sounds like a good place to stop. Our second Porsche, the 2024 Porsche 911 GT3, with the Manti package on it, which I think someone can explain what that actually is. Robinson? Oh, yeah. So Why not, <laughs> Brian? The Manti the wealth of all Racing is a German racing organization over across the pond there, and they have put this package together for the 911. It's essentially... Uh, a mega aero package uh, front to back sides everywhere you could enhance the aero they've done it then they've also um, made some reinforcements structurally just to handle all that additional downforce there are certain Porsche dealers that will install it and uh, you can get a there's a couple different levels that you can get but essentially there's such a big leap from the GT3 to the GT3 RS. Oh, yeah. This is kind of a tweener model. Same four liter, uh, flat six, 500 horsepower, and uh, just incredible amount of downforce. It's like icing on the cake, and, and apparently in Europe, you can actually buy the package and install it yourself, but here it has to be dealer installed. Yeah, At I least think, that was what I got. Yeah, and the Porsche Kyle was with us, was yeah. one of uh, <laughs> uh, Porsche's, Porsche's uh, caretakers. Um, I think he said it took him because he was there for the build. I think he put it on. Yeah, he said he it was like 18 it. hours or yeah, something I like that, that to put it on. Um, so, and Porsche owns now like 51% of Manti, which oh, is really? new. It wasn't that way before. So he said, yeah, I mean, you can you can buy a GT3 uh, and tell them to just put it on and then deliver it to you. You can own a GT3, a 992 generation, and then tell them that you want it. You can already own it and then take it to them. They'll put it on for you. And then I think they're working on one for the previous generation, uh, uh, 911 GT3. Uh, but basically it all adds up to uh, exactly what Robinson said is, is a – basically split the difference between GT3 and GT3 RS. The GT3 RS we had last year, that's their their top of the line uh, performance 911. Um, I think this one 
hit under seven minutes at the Norch yeah, Life, man. which is a, a pretty big deal compared to the the 911 G, the standard GT3, which is just over seven minutes. Uh, I felt it was a lot closer to the GT3 RS than the GT3 in uh, terms of just general confidence in the front end, being able to throw it into a corner at speeds I typically wouldn't be able to. Uh, and the, the the constant with Porsche is, you know, we go through some tires at Roebling, and if you could look at those tires on day three, and it's like we haven't even used yeah. them. <laughs> it's incredible. And that's a huge thing at this track. We usually go through tires like uh, – yeah. I could do bottled water. And, and keep in mind, we're going to come yeah. back to this. But yeah. so I mentioned how fast I was coming off a of nine. So I hit, I think, like 163, maybe 164 at the end of the straight in the in the Manti package. Everybody remember this because it's going to come back up <laughs> later in the podcast. Uh, the thing looks so intimidating, like sitting on the, isn't there when you get in it and drive yeah. it? It's, it's like, true. yeah, it's and it's 911. And it's noticeably faster than anything coming down the straight. Like you see it go by and it doesn't matter who's driving it. It's going faster than anything. It has this really cool, I mean, the wing on it is just huge, but it has, uh, I think one of the standout features to it are these aero discs that uh, go cool. on. They look, uh, at first you're like, that's kind of really, but they yeah. are cool. Describe exactly what you're talking about because they were pretty unique. So like if you look at it from a, the car from a distance, you'd probably think there's like two different sets of wheels that are on it um, but essentially it's like a disc that attaches to the two rear wheels and allows the air to flow through a little bit better as it approaches that rear wing um, just optimizing everything so it looks it looks a little funky but then when you like look at it a little bit harder you're like okay wait a second that's actually like really cool that's all the kind of things that a race team if they're allowed to is going to do to a car to yeah. get that little extra edge yeah. and, and this is what you've got i think they added stuff underneath in terms of aero too yeah, like it was it and, yeah because yeah, yeah. you could turn the at one point we thought something was hanging down but it was just extra aero going to the front wheels but then i'm looking under there there's not like a single gap under that car it's almost yeah. completely closed off and the um, the windshield as well was like a special type of yeah, we glass like because yeah. Cup. Yeah. we usually suction cup our GoPros onto all sorts of glass, and they said that was a, that was a no no. Fascinating car, fascinating six vehicles. We're gonna hold off two of the vehicles to talk about a little bit later in the show, and it's two that basically are are, are two uh, Detroit uh, bound America. vehicles, <laughs> two American vehicles, the, the 2024 domestics. Ford Mustang Dark Horse, a new model for the Mustang, and the 2024 Chevrolet Corvette hard to get his tens, hen's teeth Z06, which uh, both were incredible at this track. Um, we're going to be moving on, but I want to basically just take just a moment to say thank you to our sponsors of the podcast and of our television series, Motor Week, Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper, and the folks over at TireRack.com. We know everybody out there that's listening and everybody that watches Motor Week appreciates your dedication to Motor Week. Let's move on to our normal lightning round. And as we alluded to at the top of the show, this is something that we saw quite a bit of uh, on the news in the last few weeks with all the cold weather. Electric vehicles, and in this case it was specifically Teslas, but I think they were just the ones that were singled out. Mm -hmm. They made headlines as the extreme cold wave uh, gripped the Midwest. They saw a number of their vehicles, EVs and mostly all Teslas that we saw in the video, stuck at chargers, at Tesla chargers, are in and around Chicago. Now, many Tesla owners spent hours waiting for their cars to charge instead of 30 or 45 minutes, as advertised. And some even had to have them towed as the batteries died or wouldn't charge at all. Okay, the question for our trio, is there anything that EV owners can do, and this is EVs in general, to avoid this if they live in colder climates? Because after all, that in many cases in the Northeast and the Midwest is where EVs are selling the best. Battery preconditioning. I Which think means is what? Essentially, your car is really, really smart. And um, it will heat, or in uh, warm weather, it will cool your battery to an optimized temperature that will allow it to uh, charge 
at the advertised speeds. Now, we all know that cold hinders batteries. I mean, I think if you own a phone, uh, you probably have recognized they that at some point. They discharge quicker. Um, it's the same deal with EVs, specifically lithium-ion batteries. So I think a huge part of it is battery preconditioning. And if you're sitting out there waiting hours to charge, um, yeah, I, I understand. I bet that's probably why some of these Teslas ended up dying because their car is trying to regulate the temperature so that it can get up to charge, but they're waiting so long in like sub-zero temperatures. Standing still. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, uh, and basically, uh, just think ahead, uh, which is something you probably need to do already as a uh, EV owner, which I'm sure uh, EV opponents are just laughing their butts off right now me saying that but i mean it's true because that's just how batteries are um there are ways to get around it so like if you do have access to a charger at home um if you want to warm the car up instead of just wasting your own battery power keep it plugged in and let it warm up for 20 30 minutes um it, try to keep the charge between 20 and 80 percent again think ahead like if you're if you're going somewhere overnight where you're not going to have access to a charger charge it uh, the day before to make sure you got enough charge. Um, and yeah, so an interesting anecdote, we have um, an EV6 GT, which I took home last night to charge. And so you can, the way you precondition that battery is you set the EV charging location in your nav. Mm -hmm. So once you have it set, say it's 10 miles away, and you set start guidance, it'll then start automatically preconditioning the battery for you, getting it to the right temperature, so that theoretically by the time you get there, it's already it's primed ready. and ready to roll. It even comes up, it looks like a little glow plug uh, for if you're familiar with diesels, when you have to warm those up. Uh, it looks like it's literally a little glow plug that shows up in the battery charge area. And then when you get there at that point, it's, it's um, preconditioned, ready to go. But it does give you a warning saying, just so you know that while you're driving there, because we have to get the battery to the right temperature, it will use more battery than it would had you just been driving without preconditioning the battery. So there is a cost there, but you end up making it back once you get to the charger ready to roll. Brian. That's great information. I have nothing to add. <laughs> oh. Well, let me add a little something. Um, a lot of what we heard from Tesla after the fact responding to these news stories was basically – you know, we, we've laid out all of these things that you can do, uh, and you need to follow them. But summing them up, here's what Hertz tells folks that are renting Teslas from them in cold climates. And the first thing is exactly what you said, Greg, warm up the battery uh, and get it preconditioned. They also said warm up your cabin before you actually drive because that basically will re – then you can turn your heat down uh, while you're driving, and that reduces the uh, uh, how much power is being taken from the battery. You also mentioned using the navigation, and they say use the navigation even for your regular routes because yep. it will get you there as fast as possible, yep. and, again, it will precondition the battery for their superchargers. Uh, they said if you've got it at home, leave it plugged in all the time in cold weather uh, immediately after you get somewhere if at all possible plug it in again they also say while you're still still at home make sure you completely defrost the vehicle and get all the ice off of it they didn't go on to a couple of other things uh, that are more safety related including get winter tires um, and slow down but basically they're saying precondition Keep it plugged in and let the car plan the route and you'll get the maximum out of the battery. Yeah, I think a lot of people just have to realize that in some of these extreme cold areas, you're not going to meet EPA range estimates. I mean, it's the same as a gas engine vehicle. You're going to get worse fuel economy in the wintertime when it's cold, naturally. But I think if you own an EV or looking to buy an EV and you live somewhere where it's cold, I think you have to just be really practical. You got to do your it. homework though. You've Absolutely. got to basically, you've, you know, if you're not used to looking up information about a new car, you don't ever look at the owner's manual, you've got to do that. So you are prepared. Yep. One last thing I have to add is that uh, most EVs also for the climate have a driver only function. So that instead of mm. heating the whole car, if you are driving by yourself, you can just send all that air conditioning or heat 
to the driver instead of all around the car. So I leave it on that setting all the time. Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all about me. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you don't want people in the car with you. It forces them out. To, to be fair here, you know, for folks out there saying, ah, that just shows you how EVs are impractical in cold weather. If you live in the Midwest or the Northeast and you are in a climate where you get these incredibly below zero temperatures, chances are you either have or have had in the past a block heater on your car, sure. on your internal combustion yeah, engine absolutely. to keep the engine warm and that and the oil basically so it'll flow. And that's something you plug in all the time. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's battery or internal combustion in extreme climates, you've got to do something extra. But one thing before we move on, I, we should mention, I, we talked about it on a podcast probably, I don't know, maybe a year ago, a couple months ago. Um, but like diesel engines in extreme cold have exactly. very, very similar issues where it's sometimes, you know, they won't even start. And we had right. talked about um, an organization up, I believe, in Alaska that was starting to utilize all electric school buses. Mm -hmm. um, because they found them to be a little bit more reliable than, than, than diesel up in extreme right. cold. So just like everything, there's pros and cons. And like John had mentioned, you know, I think, you, you know, if you just have to do a little bit more of and your homework. You, but it's uh, possible. It's plausible. Now, if you're sitting there in a temperate climate and you're basically saying not invented here, remember you have heat in the summer. Take a look at the extreme conditions in reverse because that also affects uh, yeah, batteries. Absolutely. Very good, everybody. Let's move on <laughs> to our uh, other two, the last two vehicles from our Roebling Road 2024 adventure. Starting with the 2024 Ford Mustang Dark Horse, the first new name for a performance Mustang that I can remember in a long time. Anybody like to kind of give us the uh, nutshell of what the Dark Horse really is? I can give some of the details. Um, the a few more horsepower, essentially a, a GT with the 5 liter V8, a few more horsepower to Around round it 500, up to right? 500. Is that 500? Yep. Yeah. And uh, suspension upgrade. And it's uh, if you remember the Mach 2 previous gen, this is similar setup to that, just uh, with a new name. Uh, I haven't. This is the first of uh, this generation Mustang I had a chance to drive, so I can't really compare it to the uh, standard, standard GT. GT. But Greg, I know you've driven both, so maybe you yeah. can take it from there. Yeah, I mean, and I only drove the uh, the the Mustang on the street, but uh, next to the previous generation GT500, this uh, Mustang Dark Horse probably drives. Um, the most unlike a Mustang I've ever driven next to that GT500 um, because meaning. meaning that it's super hard to unsettle it on the racetrack. <laughs> I was waiting for that. It's but you know if you're it's got it's so traditional much pony cars, you're always yeah, looking for traction in the all back. You do is not look at this the throttle way. or just yeah. jerk the wheel or just do something kind of unexpected to move weight around and it'll it'll step out. But we all had to try really hard to to unsettle it, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the suspension updates, but. There's also just plain old rubber. It's like 305 width tires yeah. up front, like 315 in the rear. So there's just so much rubber on the ground, and they're basically slick tires. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, a very un-Mustang-like drive on the racetrack in a good way because it's very fast. It's very grippy. Uh, it sounds great. Uh, but I think the, the glaring weakness with this specific car that we had – was the transmission that had the 10-speed auto. Um, and every, it screamed for a manual transmission. Every single one of us yeah. had the same comment. Which you can get. Yeah. Yeah. Which you can get, yes. Yeah. And we, I think it's the, it's such a good car that the transmission was, it just was the obvious downside it, of it. It was a little slow in shipping, it shifting. It just couldn't quite keep track. up with what you right. wanted the car Even to if do. If you're in drive, it was yeah. it was kind of a step behind, and sometimes a step ahead in some cases. And then you would think, okay, well, let's throw it in manual and use the paddles. And even then, it wouldn't let you do what you wanted to do. It, yeah. You had to kind of think ahead, again, with like uh, like Teslas in, in cold weather. You have to think ahead where you almost had to sh touch the paddle before you needed to shift because then it would take a beat. And then even downshifting in the corners, it would just lock you out if it didn't right. if you didn't meet its parameters. Yeah, my last run on it, I finally I felt felt good about it. Yeah, you got to plan way ahead, as you mentioned. Uh, and just 10, 10 gears, it's just way too much for a track. Cause especially there, there's so many 
um, like sweeping corners where you're just constant throttle or just adding a little bit of throttle and you either have to upshift in the middle of it or down, you know upshift ahead before you get in there. It's just it's just too many gears for a track. Agreed. But um, I don't want to harp on that too much because it really is a good track car. And I think it, with a manual, it would have. I think we probably would have been thinking of that as yeah. the, one of our favorite cars. It sounded awesome. I mean, every Mustang V8 sounds awesome, but I don't know. To me, the sound was a lot more realistic than last gen. That to me, it kind of had a fake sound. This thing just sounded loud, aggressive, and uh, like almost straight piped. I mean, it sounded awesome. I also think, like, stylistically, the exterior, I think what they did to c differentiate it from just a normal GT and, of course, an EcoBoost, like, I think it's a mean-looking car in, like, a very good way. When that thing would come down the straight, it was just it was just really menacing um, and kind of, you know, there's just a little bit of, like, a body kit on it, and it has this, like, new front fascia where it's, uh, like, blacked out there. Um, so it looks really, really good. It had the, the Recaro seats in it, which are actually really comfortable, personally. I thought that they're some of the most comfortable sports seats that I've uh, been in myself. Um, and then probably, I mean, Greg and I drove this generation Mustang, and um, I, I do like, it's, like, custom how much you can customize the new digital gauges. Um, I know a lot of people really like the analog gauges, but this is the digital future. And I just, I think you're able to kind of see more, um, more customization in like a very good way. Like I, like the, being able to use those like Fox body, um, you know, uh, gauges on them. I know they're, they're digital, but it's just a really, really cool, um, way that you can like customize your Mustang and Ford says they're going to do more stuff with like, that in the future so like all good stuff no i do I not i bell. do not want you i respect yeah. the bell Let's i want on. our listeners to yeah. get every bit of your no, wisdom uh, what so I, spit it out i had nothing wise to say move on no 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 all right we will move on. I can't get it. You know, I can only make him do so much. 2024 Chevrolet Corvette Z06. Currently the ultimate new generation Corvette. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think it looks fantastic. Uh, 670 horsepower thanks to an all new LT6 uh, V8, which is pretty much right out of their C8R uh, race car. Uh, flat plane crank. Uh, sounds insane, uh, more more so than any other uh, Corvette. Um, I did the acceleration runs in that, um, 2.6 to 60. It's got a launch control, which you can customize. You know, you can set where you want it. Uh, I was launching at, like, 4,500 RPM. Oh, really? <laughs> and the thing was just, like, a tiny bit of slip and yeah. then just took off. It, it was, was only one time I remember you slipped up a little bit. Yeah. But that's crazy. crazy. I thought you'd be down, like, mile. three. Yeah, no, 4,500. And it, it, the launch control is cool. It tells you, you know, you can – you just floor it. It revs there. It hangs at 4,500. But it lets it hang there for, like, a couple seconds before it tells you go. It gives you a green light. So I think it just does that because it wants you to hear it as much as possible. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> so good. Went, yeah, it does yeah. sound fantastic. I went back and looked at some of our uh, GoPro footage, and, I mean, I didn't really <laughs> – we don't really have a lot of time to do a lot of customization of the gauges when we hop into cars and go. But I noticed that. So the launch control window was up when I was driving on the track. And when I would – I could see my brake pressure going into corners, uh -huh. and it would so it would say like launch control not active. <laughs> right. And then by the time I was at the end of the uh, braking zone, it would be like, all right, you can go into launch control. <laughs> like, no, not now. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's a it's a very cool looking car, and I got I can't wait till people see this test because me and uh, Ben Davis, shout out to Benny D, uh, just got some spectacular exterior shot to this car because it was like the perfect day to shoot it was like a very moody background and i know i'm not talking about performance here but it's more artistic uh it was just a menacing looking car uh much more so than the c8 i think this is the best looking version of the c8 that probably will ever exist um and then you drive it and it sounds phenomenal it sounds like no corvette that's ever existed before because of that flat plane 
we always paired it with the 911 because they were the two fastest mm-hmm. cars. And uh, you couldn't really tell if you weren't looking which car was coming down the street. Oh, yeah. Normally the Porsche yeah. is like obvious, but really you couldn't tell because that high frequency, high revving engine. Uh, but here's where I get to the whole, remember uh, I said the 911, I was hitting about 163 before I started braking. Uh, now keep in mind that 911 has about what, 510, 520 horsepower, something like that? Uh, I think it's like 502, I think. 500, yeah. so not even yeah. that much. Yeah. So 500 horsepower. The Z06 has 670 horsepower. I gave it the my best shot probably 10 times to get to a top mm-hmm. speed. And I only, I think we saw like 160, maybe 161. And this car has 670 horsepower. Uh, and I'm not sure why it's not faster. I don't know. And Robinson, you had meant, you'd brought up an interesting it's thing about heavier. torque. No, it's, yeah. well, it's 200 pounds heavier. Right. Not, enough, not enough to make a difference. It only has 460 pound feet of torque, which is surprising that there's 190 less than the horsepower. Normally they're pretty close to yeah, each other. Yeah, you say those numbers are pretty close, Square. and it certainly doesn't feel like it, like in accelerations. So, yeah, it's definitely some but tuning. The other interesting thing you said was, is you hit like 130 in the quarter mile. Right. We're coming off of turn nine, and we have like a whole half mile to get down there, and I still only and got to only 160. Build 30 miles an hour on top of that. Yeah, yeah uh, which, which is, it's just an interesting part that I'd be curious about. Like, maybe, like, I, I don't want to say it's conspiracy theory. Like, is it detuned <laughs> in some way? Like, uh, why did this car not go? I. It felt but like I would love w- for somebody to tell me, maybe I'm not driving hard enough, but I would argue that I've driven every other car there the exact same way and I've gotten faster. Maybe the digi- the speedometers are wrong in other cars. I don't know. I would love to be explained to, but all I can say is that when I was driving this car at the end of the straight on this particular week, I was asking myself, why is it not going faster? But did it feel as fast? It felt fast because, like, I, and then Robinson knows this. Like, I went out for a warm up lap with some with somebody. He's like, I thought you were doing a warm up lap. I'm like, I was, <laughs> because it's so fast. Like, I was going through corners at a much higher rate than I was in the the standard Stingray because it's it's just so grippy and and quick. Yeah, the last Corvette we had there, we're like, man, this chassis could handle so much more power, which they've delivered. But yeah. then they also made the chassis better. So now it needs. It's another couple hundred more horsepower. I think it needs to go over yeah. well over yeah. 700. Do you think that maybe it might have something to do with the new E-Ray? Uh, that's a, that's the the electric uh, Corvette, which a has, hybrid, a, has hybrid. was a hot way out. Technically, it's a hybrid. Hybrid all It has a drive. small electric motor in the front to give it some because, to make it four wheel drive. I, think, I love them. It has some extra. Because I want to say, I it. think technically the that is faster than the CO6. It's the tenth quicker. Yeah. Yeah. It's quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Is it faster yeah. though? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's faster. Yeah, it's quicker, but maybe not faster around the track. Which we hopefully we will find out relatively soon. Definitely need one. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. That's our rundown of our uh, eight Roebling Road 2024 masterpieces. The BRZ, the GR86, the Cayenne Turbo GT, the Lamborghini Urus Performante, the Audi RS7, the Porsche 911 GT3 with the Manti, Ford Mustang, Dark, Dark Horse, Dark and of course, Dark Horse, <laughs> and the Z06. Quite a roster. Of vehicles yeah. to take down there. Absolutely. And um, we had a, a great time, and we've got some great video, as Greg mentioned, coming up for you in addition soon I on Motor Week. We, some words we yeah, might even not, yeah. even, we might not even show track okay. shots of the Z06. That's how good of static <laughs> shots we got. Uh, they were And beautiful. I got a fantastic hero shot of Robinson. Just oh my God. The oh, wind yeah. was perfect. The lighting was perfect. And he's just leaning up against the Lambo. Uh, <laughs> and I got this fantastic like drone uh, shot. Our hero <laughs> shot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, anybody have a rant and rave uh, this week? Before we wrap rant about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had a good time. It was a, it was ended up being a great trip regardless of the cold. Okay. Um how about you? I might have a Oh, bit of a the rant. lady speaks up. Go ahead. That has nothing to do with anything we really talked about today. Um so my dad is um in the market for a new car and um once he rode in my Maverick, he was like, ooh, I like the idea. Bring us up to date. People may not realize you just got a brand new Maverick hybrid. Yeah, Ford Maverick uh, hybrid. uh, Took delivery that like a month or two ago. Um, And so the first time that he was in it, 
and he, he he told me he'd never been in a hybrid before. I actually I never really bring cars around him. He doesn't live super close to me, so. Um, but it was his first time in a hybrid, and, and he was really really coming around to the idea of buying a hybrid. Well, so now we're kind of thinking about going car shopping. Um, he likes the idea of a hybrid. He has a Mazda CX-5 right now. It's getting up there, almost 200,000 miles. And so he wants something new with more convenience features. And I'm kind of looking around, and there's just, like, brands that we have to, like, we don't even will go see cars of because they don't offer don't any offer. traditional hybrids. Right. And so looking for something comparable to a CX-5, Mazda doesn't have any hybrids. So my dad really liked liked Mazda that's kind of out of the question um so the, I'm just my rant is that I'm just shocked of how small the list is I thought it would be bigger for the amount of hybrid uh crossovers which that I mean compact crossovers five seaters that's the largest segment right. that you know to exist and and your options are incredibly limited and critics would say, I would agree with you, critics of EVs say, would say that the uh, car companies in general have spent too much time concentrating on pure electrics and missed this middle step, which Honda and Toyota have shown to be extraordinarily viable. There's one domestic. There is right. one domestic, and that is Ford. Right. With, with their escape. With the escape. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about pure HEVs. I'm not talking about plug-in hybrids. Right. Just... An electric powertrain to assist the gasoline powertrain, small battery, not uh, not a lot of, uh, no plug-in capabilities, mm -hmm. but gives you anywhere from a 30 to 50 percent boost in fuel economy. Oh. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, I think it's very sad. Yeah. We could be doing, uh, for those folks that, that hold the environment um, as something we need to work on very, really hard, uh, there have been a lot of studies out there that show that uh, going more for hybrids over pure electrics actually can do more for the environment quicker. Correct. That's actually a good point that you mentioned. I was just referenced like a, I forget what the study was, but they looked at people who were transitioning from um, traditional gasoline engines to hybrids um, and compared to people who were tra transitioning from pure hybrids to all electric mm -hmm. and their the impact on the environment via right. emissions was significantly more from the people who were going from gas to hybrid right. compared to those going from hybrid to all electric. I mean most of us have all driven hybrids that get 45, 55, 60 miles per gallon. Yeah. Versus 24 to 30. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Good point. Well, I think that wraps up our program today. Thanks everybody for listening to our podcast. And if you are, whoops, and if you're wondering what time Motor Week, the TV series, can be seen on your local public television station, go ahead there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> he wonder He's reaching for the bell, folks. Sorry, over. <laughs> go to motorweek.org and click on the tab Watch Motor Week and then enter your zip code for the days and times in your area or hop over to our cable partner, MavTV.com, for their schedule. You can also stream Motor Week episodes for free on your mobile device or streaming box by downloading the PBS app available at your device's app store or streaming channel library. That's good advice. Download the PBS app, and it's free, and you get Motor Week and a lot of other programs for free. Free, all you of say. It. Free, I say. Maybe I'll download this app. <laughs> and also free, all of our individual road test and feature segments are available at YouTube.com slash Motor Week. Folks, if you've got a screen, you can watch Motor Week. And I want to say special thanks to podcast producer Jessica Ray, audio engineer Austin Harris, podcast creator Bob Mixter, and for Brian Robinson and Greg Carlos, I'm John Davis. Thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Auto Value and Bumper to Bumper and TireRack.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.